Celtics Beat is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNX Media Network. Mm. All right. Well, let's 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 do it. We have to do it, right? It's a new edition of Celtics Beat. We're coming at you twice a week, thanks to our great sponsors. And uh, in light of the fact that we are sponsored by a uh, a, a a sports book, a, a, a gambling company, uh, I'm I'm tempted to just get into what a bath I took today. Uh, Nobody wants to, to hear about how terrible you are at gambling, Colin. Yeah, nope. No, 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 no. no. Why the people Not- are here. Not terrible at gambling. Bad this is beats. therapy for you. Bad beats were the story of today, but that's that's okay. We're not the people out there. I reckon there's there are there are forums for that. This is not that. This is not why people come to this show. They they want us to bitch and moan about the Celtics or maybe try and make people feel a little bit better. They do not care about my bankroll. So that's fine. I acknowledge all of that. Adam Kaufman, Evan Valenti is back with us. Uh, we're staying in the heavy family. We had Sean Devaney on a couple of days ago, and here we've got Steve Bullpet with us. Of course, uh, he has covered the beat for as long as anybody in this market and do, doing so to the, the highest of levels. So the most important insights that we can offer. And guys, uh, of course, the Celtics, anyone who's listening knows this, the C's despite a fourth quarter surge and really a a game that I, I saw our guy John Zanis put it's it's funny how the Celtics in a game they had no business winning somehow found a way to blew it uh, blow it they uh, they they nearly won they lost in overtime it was 116 115 in Philadelphia so now this second round set is a best of three instead of a three one series lead going back to Boston which I truly did believe it was going to be but for whatever reason whether it was Jason Tatum's very slow start, tough first half for him. And, you know, it didn't get what no points or hardly any points before he came on the third quarter. Malcolm Brogdon, it's inexplicable to me how a professional basketball player, especially one we're talking about the sixth man of the year, someone who is as good as he is, cannot hit a layup to save his life. Stupid turnovers often, you know, from from a, a, an innumerable number of guys, the Pass just a, a hair too late by Jason Tatum at the end. You can get into the lack of timeout by Joe Mazzula, the defensive decision by Jason uh, uh, or Jalen Brown, rather, on Joel Embiid and allowing the three pointer to James Harden. There are a lot of things to unpack. If I had a pillow, I would scream into it. Steve, I'm very frustrated about this thing. And 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 I, I, I never feared it going seven games. And now that it's a best of three, very naturally, I do have that fear. How do you feel about what we've seen so far? Um. I think you need to get counseling. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm worried about you. Thank you. I appreciate you know, the, the I mean, concern. Talk to somebody. Get help. So it's good to have friends who care. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I look, the, the Celtics, what they screwed up in the first half is what killed them at the end, basically. They shouldn't have been in that situation where a mistake, a couple of mistakes, cost them a game uh they shouldn't they should have been playing a certain way earlier and and they didn't and they you know look they had to figure that the the sixers were going to change something i i wrote remember tweeting out during game two at the start how the the big difference appeared to be uh, jalen brown picking up james harden a couple feet outside the sixers locker room and that really screwed things up. And, and I was surprised that it was able to, it was that the Sixers allowed it to happen uh, in game three as well. And today, uh, game four, the Sixers had somebody else bring up the ball most of the time. But and instead of other people realizing, okay, if Jalen Brown's not picking up the ball handler and you know, harassing the hell out of him, maybe we got to do it. And, you know, that's you've got to get into those guys and not let them get comfortable, not let them get downhill where they get you in defensive rotations. You know, um, you want your rotations to be I see uh, I'm, I've got the passing lane, you know, uh, triangled off and I'm going to step into it. That's the rotation and pick pick the ball off. But they didn't play with that kind of defensive intensity in the first half. And um, they allowed some guys to get hot. They allowed Harden to get hot. Uh, allowed him to get comfortable. It never should have happened. And how did they get back into the game? By making guys incredibly uncomfortable. You know, um, the the blocks, Al Horford was incredible. I mean, the block shots. Joel Embiid's the MVP of the league. Mm -hmm. And he looked foolish. Al Horford made him look foolish uh, for a good part of that fourth quarter. 
Um, but then, you know, you, you make the mistake uh, doubling off of uh, James Harden when you already had another guy coming around to, to help with the double team there. So, you know, um, you know, the errors and, you know, we're going to, we're going to wait until there's no time left to get a shot off, uh, you know, crazy stuff. Well, so can we drill down a little bit on something you're alluding to? And I'm, I, I'm, I, I think I'm oversimplifying this, but it, it, it is also just reality. James Harden goes off in game one, you lose a tight game. You more than contain him in game two, you win going away. You contain him again in game three, and you win a game that was, you know, tighter, but never overly stressful. And you lose a tightly contested game that you have to come back <coughs> down 16 in game four, when once again, James Harden goes off. So the common denominator here, obviously, is James Harden, great, you lose, albeit close games, but you lose. James Harden, terrible, shooting five for 28 or whatever between two games you win. How do they go about in game five getting that version or a subdued version of James Harden versus what we've seen in games one and four? Well, just because Harden, if he's not bringing the ball, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be on him like crazy. You know, you should be on him before he gets the ball. You should make him have to work twice as hard as he did in the first half just for the catch alone. Um, it was crazy. Um, so that's huge right there, I think. And just with everybody, look, one thing, and I'm, I, you know, look, referees make mistakes. I get that. But I, I think this whole thing that like these referees are incompetent, this stuff, I think that's a crock. I think these guys are good. But there's one thing that's always been true. And that is that the more aggressive team gets the benefit of the whistle. And it's, it's physics in a lot of ways. If you're being more aggressive, that means you're, you're moving forward. You're on the balls of your feet. It means the other team is, on its heels to a degree, either literally or figuratively, they're reaching, they're not going to get calls. The more aggressive team sets the tone, gets the whistle. That's the way it is. And the Celtics were the more aggressive team in the fourth quarter, got themselves back in a game, got themselves a lead. Um, you know, when things are moving fast, the referees are like, should I call this? It plays, the ball's already going to the direction. You know, it's hard to make those calls. Um, refereeing, I've, I've written this before. It's, it's like, there's a blender going off and there's a bunch of stuff in it and they drop you in the middle of that blender. That's the referee. And you got to pick out which, which, where the blueberry is, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous job and you have to make it harder on them by playing faster defensively, by speeding the other team up, by not letting the Sixers get into their stuff and not letting them, you know, see the double team coming and and beat your rotation with the pass just be more aggressive get into guys make their lives more difficult make them flustered the way that the Celtics guys got flustered at different times at critical times this game Ev, no one will ever confuse me for a professional athlete and that was never in the cards obviously but it's a good it's, it's it's a good thing because I could never do it watching that game and I obviously wasn't out there on the floor. I'm not in the coaching staff. I'm in no way affiliated with the organization other than just covering them in this loose podcast sense and being a fan or whatever else. But <laughs> watching that, I I would have I I might like have have a somewhat sleepless night. I if I were actually on that team, I would not sleep for a week losing a game the way they lost tonight. Well, they've done a lot of not sleeping and, and all this stuff after losing to the Warriors in the finals at home, I think. I don't think this is really anything super out of the ordinary for them. They've been, you know, they've been in a lot of tough series over the past couple of years, you know, pretty much since Tatum's got there, as my dog now chews a toy in front of me. Um, I know it's adorable. Uh, and But it's, it's one of these things. They've been through a lot of stuff together. They've been through... You know, a game seven against LeBron James and, you know, a bunch of threes don't go in and, you know, the, the season doesn't go their way. You know, last year, obviously, uh, you know, losing the step at home the way they did, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough to come back. And that's the one thing I think about this team that I, I kind of respect is the mental toughness. And a lot of people don't think this team is mentally tough because of the way they seem to not take people seriously all the time. But I think today's game and this is we're recording this on Sunday, you'll probably hear this mostly Monday. Um, I think today's game is an example of the fact that they are a mentally tough team because they were down early. Nothing was going right. I think in terms of physicality, I think Philly did a great job. I don't think we're doing enough credit crediting Philly for coming out aggressive early, as you know, Steve alluded to 
the aggression of the fourth quarter for the Celtics and the ball bounced away a little bit more. But I thought Philly defensively in the first quarter, the first half was excellent, especially in the first quarter. Um, they made it really uncomfortable for Boston to kind of get set, to run anything. Boston didn't get a lot of great looks. And even the, the good looks they got, they they missed because they were out of rhythm and out of sync. Um, so credit to Philly on that one. I, I think, you know, look, this, this series has come out to the point where it's where everybody, you know, kind of assumed it'd be. Everybody holds serve kind of, right? They were 2-2 going back to Boston. And, you know, these are two pretty good teams. I mean, I, I am guilty probably more than most of not giving Philly – the proper amount of respect, I guess. I've been one of the people that says I don't sweat Philly at all, and I probably still don't. But at the same time, I do have to give them credit for the way they came out and attacked this game. I mean, uh, uh, Boston, um, you know, was was out of sorts early and, and rallied late, but it wasn't enough. That's the thing with me about this game, Adam, is it's a one-point game into the game. We could analyze every single possession at this point. Like, I thought there was a, a point in the fourth quarter, Malcolm Brogdon turned it over, and I was like, that's he was trying to split. He was trying to start like a fast break into the basket by himself. And he ended up getting it, giving it back to James Harden. Mm. I'm like, man, that's the one right there. That's going to be the one that kills this team because at that point, momentum had gone a certain way. I mean, you can analyze everything at this point. I, I'm just, you know, well, 16 from 22 from the free throw line. You could analyze that if you'd like. Yeah, we could do a lot of stuff. And, and, you know, at, everybody's analyzing either the timeout or the the double team at the end. But the beauty of this game is there's a lot more possessions than that. Um, you know, this team didn't execute as well in the first half and then the second half, they do a better job in the first half. This game's not going to overtime. So um, I think they're going to be ready for game five as everybody, I think would assume. Um, I think they have a good veteran laden crew. It's not like they don't have guys in there that have been through this before. I'm, Again, I'm not – it's not great it's going back 2-2, two, two, but at the same time, like, Adam, I feel pretty confident about this team going forward. So that in mind, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping ahead, but what the hell? Best of three. You're looking at it. If you were I, – I know you're not generally someone who's in the, the prediction-making business, but if you were looking at it and saying, this is how this series is going to play out, game four, game – or game five, game six, potentially game seven, what do you think we're going to be looking at? I think the way the Celtics approach games – uh, once they get into them, uh, makes it impossible to say with any kind of certainty what's going to happen. If the Celtics were mentally tough to the degree they need to be, they'd have another banner hanging, and they wouldn't have come out the way they did in the first half. Look, today, uh, there's a difference between playing fast and getting rushed by the other team. Playing fast, at, you know, where you're making the play, by where you're playing with force and getting things, that's Right there, huge. And look, in the first half, things could have changed significantly if the Celtics had made a few more wide open shots. Okay, they missed some some wide open threes, mm -hmm. and that could have churned things because when you make a few shots, all of a sudden your energy seems to pick up defensively. It, you can't have your your defensive energy be reliant on whether the ball is going through the strings for you or not. But it's a fact of life, especially with this team. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we probably talked about it in the past, but there was a comment from uh, Grant Williams this summer saying that uh, that the Celtics were more talented than the Warriors, but the Warriors are just more disciplined. Mm -hmm. Well, discipline's a talent. You know, discipline is something you have to have in your bag if you want to win. And, you know, uh, look, the – the Warriors, after that series, they were like, yeah, we got into them and they folded up at critical times. And they were talking like that afterwards. They And they were saying it with a little bit of surprise and a little bit of swagger. This is private talk. So, um, you know, this team has got to realize who, it, who they are. And they know what they look like when they're successful. The fact that they wouldn't do it every single minute of every single game is uh, it's going to go down with the great mysteries of the world. You know, I mean, we're going to be looking for that and Sasquatch and Bigfoot and, you know, <laughs> that, that Malaysian airplane and stuff, too. It's, you know, who knows? I don't understand. And it's hard to understand. And, and these guys know it and everyone around the team knows it. You play the way you're supposed to. There's not a team in this league that should beat you. I was saying to Evan just before we fired up the show was watching the game, you know, in real time, sort of the the 
saving grace for me or the thing that left me optimistic at halftime, even though they were down by nine and had that late surge in the second quarter, was the fact that Jason Tatum hadn't done anything. And someone may hear that and say, well, what do you mean? If Jason Tatum had had this, you know, basically a Jalen Brown like first half and both those guys were doing well and maybe they weren't getting as much out of the complimentary pieces or the bench or whatever, I'd be sitting there saying, man, they might be in trouble tonight because the the two stars just aren't getting help. But when Jason Tatum does virtually nothing, at least offensively and statistically in that opening half, I was sitting there and saying, that's not going to last forever. He's going to get right. He's going to have a good second half. He's going to come out strong in the third quarter. Sure enough, he did. It, it dialed back a little bit in the fourth quarter. You could look at it and say, statistically, he actually had a pretty good game. I know he didn't go for the 30 or 40 spot, but you know, 18 rebounds and six assists. He had the four blocks. He was efficient from the field despite struggling from three-point range. He didn't even hit a three-pointer until the overtime, but he still shot basically 50% from the field overall. But what people are kind of left stung by is the fact that he did just come out with that slow start and couldn't seem to find a way and kept getting either turning it over inside or getting blocked at the rim or whatever it was he just there was no sort of rhythm for him and and a part of that obviously is a credit to the Sixers defense is Evan acknowledged but a part of it too is just you know if we're going to talk about him as one of the best players in the league which he is you know a, a maybe perennial MVP candidate for years to come fourth place this year and fourth or fifth place last year, whatever he was, what is it going to take for him to come out a little bit stronger in these games and, and have that, you know, that Jason Tatum game that people like to talk about that, that he kind of did, you know, in, in, in game one, when he went for almost 40. If, if he wants to produce more and we've been, I've been carping on this for years, for years now, he's got to do, he's got to do a little less if he wants to, to uh, achieve more. And by that, I mean, um, don't be up top with the ball. I mean, you should, he should be running off picks and getting in position to catch and finish. They should be running him through a series of picks and making whoever's guarding him, you know, have migraine headaches and, you know, bruises on the side of their temples, whatever they, they need to have him in a finisher's role, um, you know, catch and shoot, uh, catch, uh, fake, beat the closeout guy, go to the bucket. Um, you know, they got him a uh, slashing a little bit in the second half. I think the first, one of the first two plays was to get him going to the bucket, get him having him catch on the move is huge. Again, he is one of the best players in the league, you know, just cause you see him every day and, and he misses a few shots and people, you know, the more you see somebody, it, I don't know why, but it tends to devalue them. Like we think that uh, uh, Jimmy Butler is like, you know, uh, a, a golden basketball god because we see these highlights, whatever. We don't see them all year. If we did, yeah. you'd say, well, geez, why did Jimmy Butler go away in this game? Because I've, I've watched him a lot. I love the guy. He's a great guy. I'm still pissed I lost a $5 bet to him on a Marquette versus University of Dayton women's volleyball NCAA tournament game. <laughs> Um, not that I'm bitter, not at all. Um, but you know, I'm seriously, so you see a guy all the time and you tend to de devalue him for some crazy reason, but you know, when Jason is out front in the last possession of the game, you know, looking around, it's like, no, you should be giving it up. And because once if, if Jason, if Jason Tatum cuts to the basket, it's not like he's not going to draw attention. He's going to force the Philadelphia defense to move. And if one guy moves slowly or if someone goes to help when he cuts, someone's going to be open. And if he runs through the picks properly and you maybe you swing it to the guy who's open and then everyone, you know, the defense moves side to side and there Jason is again to catch and finish. Um, this stuff is simple. I think, you know, him, Jason Tatum, bringing the ball up, don't do it. Uh, and by the way, we, we've kind of glossed over one of the factors for early in this game, and that was Jalen Brown getting a couple of quick fouls. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's defense, and it's not just, you know, that I pointed it out early in that game, too. The Sixers were saying that, that Jalen Brown's defense, his defensive pressure, is what changed game two. And again, it was the same in game three. So him getting a couple of quick fouls didn't help at all. Um, and he was off to the kind of game where, you know, the Sixers are going to have to start helping on him 
and that's going to open other people up. So, you know, a bunch of things went wrong there for them, but um, it's in their hands. You know, I wish that it, it, sometimes I wish that they weren't this good because then we could look at ways they could try to trick this up and do this and do that. It's it's simple. So that 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 in mind, this is like this is going to sound. I can't think of a way to phrase this question without it sounding stupid. So I'll just ask it. Going into the series, the belief uh, we certainly felt this way, and the odds makers felt this way. And I don't know if you did; you can tell us. But the belief was the Celtics were overwhelming favorites to beat the Sixers. Part of that was previous matchups, playoffs, or regular season, and and sort of you know being Embiid's daddy and all of that. Part of it, obviously, was the fact that you didn't know Embiid's injury situation will he even play in this series and if he does what's he going to look like and on and on and on now it's tied to two again it's a best of three series and I want to say like are the Sixers live to win the series of course they are it's a best of three but do you really believe it because if we sit here and believe and and harp on the fact that Boston is absolutely the better the deeper the more talented team do you believe or 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 sort of what would go into Boston actually pissing this away uh, the question is, what do they believe, really? Um, the phrase we've used, or I've used all year, is if you want to be elite, you can't act elitist. You can't play elitist. You have to play. You have to grind. And if the Celtics come out uh, on Tuesday night and are grinding and are just playing in the mud, playing defense like that, it's theirs. This, this series is, you know, it's already gone too long in, you know, in some regards, there shouldn't be a Tuesday, um, but uh, you let it happen. So now it's like, you know, how do you want to approach this? And obviously this is critical for them. Last year, they lose game five at home to the Bucks and go to Milwaukee and, and win. So, but you don't want to, whenever you leave yourself into that kind of situation, I call it a banana peel game. You know, if you leave yourself into a game seven, you could slip on a banana peel, something crazy could happen. You're leaving all possibilities open. You want to take mm -hmm. those possibilities off the table. Um, you don't want to get involved in that. So how the Celtics come out, uh, you know, Horford said he was uh, encouraged by the way the Celtics played at the end, you know, but it's like they should be dope slapping themselves all the way back on the flight to Boston. Like, you know, how did we get here? How did we let this happen? Um, those other guys aren't bad, but if you look at the way the Celtics played defense toward the end, I'm not sure how many actual 24 second violations the Sixers got called for, but there were a couple that were de facto violations where they had to throw up a shot at the end that was never going to have a chance of going in. Mm -hmm. and that's what the kind of harassing defense can get you. And, you know, that's what the Celtics need to do. Uh, every possession. I mean, you know, they've got the, and they've got the guys to do it. And if someone gets tired, come out, use your depth more. You know, that'd be great if guys were getting too tired from kicking the Sixers butts and had to come out for a break. You know, send someone else in the game, you know, um, work it that way. Uh, and then you'll have energy for offense. Move the ball quickly. The ball finds energy. You're not just uh, walking it up and allowing the Sixers who don't want to play that kind of up and down game allowing them to rest but if you if you sit back at all defensively then you're allowing guys like Tyrese Maxey to get into the game because now you're you're kind of reacting to the Sixers instead of forcing them where to go um you know and Maxey's a really good player and they've kind of blunted him pretty well this series yeah I would agree with that I don't know I guess I would push back a little bit on you know um, as I pull up a box score here, I would push back a little bit on the fact that, you know, could they be up for nothing and this be done and this series not going to Tuesday? I mean, yeah, sure. But at the same time, we are, you know, Philly is a three seed. They've had a great defense for at least most of the second half. Um, I know Embiid's hurt. We're not, I'm not quite sure what to make about his particular injury at this point because he seems to be okay. I mean, he's, He's done a lot of damage, whether it's for an entire game or not. You know, you could argue that, but he's done. He's been effective in certain spurts, so I'm not going to, you know, con on him for anything. But 
Um, you know, it's it's the two seed versus the three seed. I mean, if we're you know, I've again, I was very dismissive of Philly, and we'll and we'll continue to probably you know do that privately. Um, but I've been impressed with certain things. I've been impressed with some of what Harden has been able to pull off in games one and game four. I thought game one he was just, I was like, man, is this is this a guy that maybe uh, I wrote off too early? Is the whole thing where he goes to Houston is there is there more validity to him actually leading a team in Houston for him just going back to a city he likes? Um, then games two and three happen, and then you know tonight happens, and he was you know I, I was spectacular for and hit the biggest shot of the game at the end of the game. Um, I think, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, I feel like we're all misjudging Philly a little bit. Like I, again, there, there's, there's not enough, ta- there's not, I mean, look at the talent discrepancy. There's no question. But, I mean, there are guys still playing the game and they're, you know, I, tonight I thought early on we're playing the game much harder than Boston was. And that was pretty much it. Um, so if that's, if that's the, that's a determinant, then how can you defend the, you know, that the Sixers, you know, if, if, if it all it took was them playing harder than the Celtics, if you reverse that, is it a game? That's fair. I'm just trying to figure out. Or is it a close game? I'm trying to figure out in terms of giving Philly the proper respect versus giving Boston the proper, um, you know, uh, you know, tongue lashing that we keep doing it in terms of like, where, you know, where does it end? You know what I mean? Like we, we have to give Boston, you know, so much credit for coming back, but at the same time, making bonehead plays at the end of the game throughout the fourth quarter. And at the same time, you know, you play, you get the credit fully for playing hard and, you know, coming up with certain, like, I, I don't know. I, I'm having a hard time talking myself through this series just because in the wins, it looks so good. And in the losses, it looks clunky, but at the same time, they still have a shot. Like, I, I know it's, I, I guess I'm having a hard time, you know, result like coming to some sort of inner peace about this series. Cause again, at times it looks like Boston's way better. And at times I don't know, and I, we've had several text threads at this point with several different people where we have so many opinions coming in constantly where I I just feel like where we often blame Boston for blowing it. I just don't think we give fully enough credit for executing in certain stretches. You know what I mean? I don't they know. Took, they took advantage of, of, what the Celtics weren't doing. So yeah, sure. And they hit some great shots. I mean, ridiculous shots. Mm-hmm. But look what, you know, and beats your MVP. Look at what happened to him down the stretch. Um, look at what happened when he got crowded, you know, and that was just, you know, playing crazy rat defense on him, you know, um, one for six in the fourth quarter. Your MVP was a minus seven in the fourth quarter. Two points, one rebound. Okay. That's what they did to Joel Embiid, the MVP in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, uh, pretty impressive, no question. It, it's so it's it's like the you know, and I want to get to this part too. That there's a difference between regular season basketball and postseason basketball. Um, the difference between how the game gets played, and um, I mean, I'll give you two words to describe essentially should tell you everything you need to know about regular season basketball versus postseason basketball. Ben Simmons. Okay. I mean, this guy, Oh, he makes a ton of money. He was, I remember the first series the Celtics played against him. I'm watching him going, this guy's awful. His decision-making is terrible. And where did his numbers come from? Well, it was from Brett Brown and the pace that they played with in the regular Mm -hmm. season. Well, you get taken out of your pace now. You're not playing someone. You're not catching anyone on a back-to-back. Okay, they've got their rest. They're you're not catching a team not prepared for what you do. You know, um, if you run a lot of zone, the Celtics, if they played the night before, aren't going to get a lot of working against zone. So, but in in a, a playoff series, sure, you're going to work on everything, uh, on counters to everything the opponent does. Um, so it's different, and and but a lot of it comes down to how hard you're willing to play. I mean, I was talking to uh, a player's relative prior to Game One, and I said, you know, if the Celtics extend the defense and you know take away shot clock on on Philadelphia, that I think this is a quick series. I mean, think about James Harden, just in particular. Uh, and what do you what do you picture when you think James Harden? He's out front dancing with the ball back and forth here, going there, this back and forth, and taking a 
you know, the uh, it's not a Euro step back, but it would be, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, South America step back. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> a little two step backwards and hitting his thing. But that's after burning a bunch of clock. If you burned, if you forced him to burn clock, bringing the ball up, or if someone else brings it up, as has happened today, you you crowd him and play passing lanes on him and make it difficult for him to get the catch. You've taken away time that he needs to set up his his dance, his shot, which is very effective. And it's you know, they'll give you the eyebrow flick and go to the bucket on you, all that stuff. But you need to cut down that time, and that happens by picking them up sooner. Um, one of the reasons the Celtics lost the finals last year was you had, for some reason, Jason Tatum bringing the ball up against pressure, which is crazy. You know, um, you need him to be giving it up, running up the court, and you know, using his energy on that. One, why was he so uh, tired and uh, fatigued by the end? You're having him do things he doesn't need to do. You had plenty of guys that could push the ball up the floor. Look at this year. I mean, sometimes the Celtic coaches look like third base coaches, you know, uh, running a guy home uh, from second on a, a a single to the, you know, to uh, uh, to short outfield. They're trying to push the ball. They're trying to get into stuff faster because if the Celtics can play against a defense that isn't set, that isn't able to load up to its stars, then it's a huge advantage for them. Simple stuff. They know they've got to do it. They don't always do it. It's like, you know something? This game's too easy for us. We need to make it a little harder. It's like you're a golfer. You know, golf's not hard enough. I need to use a blindfold <laughs> on, you know, on five of my tee shots. It's crazy. As frustrated as we are to uh, talk about a loss like the Celtics endured just a couple hours ago as we sit here in real time, and and as Evan said, you might be listening on a Monday, we are thrilled to come at you twice a week, and that is in large part because of our great sponsors here on this show, F. Yeah, our show, we're going to take a quick break tonight. Today's show is powered by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs, just like Hoffman is currently doing and losing at an alarming rate because it's right it's now. Up and, it's, it's, up it's up and down. It's up and down. It's a lot of down. Let's be real about it. Because right now, new customers are going to get no sweat, no, no sweat first bet up to $1,000. It's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. As we look at FanDuel right now, I'm trying to get early odds on game five. Celtics minus seven currently against mm. the Sixers. If you're if you're trying to get in early on some action, as I look at uh, FanDuel right now, the minus seven, and if you parlay that with the Celtics from the first half, because like they had the graphic on the screen. I'm not sure if you, either of you saw this, but I'm sure you know if you were, I think it was early in the third quarter they posted this particular stat about how much time Boston has spent leading the series versus the Sixers. The numbers were dramatic. Uh, hmm. I think they ride the ship at home. They went, they covered the minus seven and they win the first half. If you just parlay it together, it's plus 121. And that's just one very small bet of the kajillion bets you can make on FanDuel and so easy to use with the app right on your phones. I I promise you. How many times I've been walking the dog, all of a sudden the same game parlay pops into my head. I can take my phone out of my pocket, pause the podcast, throw something in. And we're all set. We got action on the game for later. It's it, it, There's great promotions every day. It's safe, secure, easy to use. And you get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. It is FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash Boston to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. Uh, I, I was scanning Twitter a little bit just uh as we've you know talked through all the different points of this thing i'm not even sure maybe i have and i don't remember I, i'm not sure i have even mentioned the name joe missoula yet during this show in part because and i i always we talk about this every show evan but i i always think that that there's over criticizing of the coach from fans just in general whatever the market certainly happens in boston uh and has for a long period of time it's it's a default complaint is you know something goes wrong with the players blame the coach happens all the time but steve i am wondering as i scroll through twitter and i'm not even talking about my mentions i'm talking about media writing about this game you know the the umbrella that is media a pretty common denominator is why the hell didn't Joe Missoula call a timeout at the end of that game? Is it something that you had a problem with as you were watching? End of the 
regulation or uh, overtime. overtime? Overtime, yeah. It was all in front of them. I mean, you know, would he, should he call it? You, know, you could say, yeah, you want to call a timeout and reset because you just had a big shot hit on you. You just screwed up a play defensively. Maybe you want to gather yourselves. Fair. But in terms of what happened, you call a timeout and say, uh, okay, look, here's what we're going to do, which they already knew what they were going to do offensively. Uh, but but um, by the way, as you're walking out to the court, uh, Jason, don't wait until there's six seconds left to do something. You know, I mean, what's the, you know, they had the end of regulation. They had a wide open shot to win it, you know, and, you know, you can say Marcus Smart, you know, but it was, it, the shot was there, you know, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. It was funny. I was talking to Joe's wife after one of the games in Boston. And I said, uh, I think it was after the second game. And I said, you know, if I want to find out who won, who wins the game, I don't even have to go to the game. I don't even have to watch. I can just look at my emails in the morning. <laughs> you know, and it's like, but you know who is getting killed? You know, what Joe needs to realize is that everybody before him has gotten killed. I mean, Doc Rivers, how many people were, were bitching to get him out of here, right, before he won? Right? I mean, okay. Brad Stevens, how much heat did Brad Stevens? Also after he won. <laughs> but go, go on. Okay, how much how much heat did Brad Stevens take? Sure. You know what I mean? And the stuff that Joe does is stuff that other coaches who are Hall of Fame coaches have done. The not calling timeout thing, and we probably told the story before, but uh, Phil Jackson, that would happen all the time, where the, the someone would make a run on the Lakers and his assistant coach, uh, a close friend of mine, Frank, uh, Frank Hamblin, rest in peace, my brother. Uh, but he would say, where he'd turn to Phil and say, we call a timeout. And Phil, in his uh, little more flowery language, would say, essentially, they got themselves into this, let them get themselves out of it. Um, and I thought that was a great strategy during the year for the Celtics to like not have them look over their shoulders, say, look, you know what to do, bail yourselves out here. Um, you know, if if the shot goes in, no one's asking that question, mm-hmm. right? If the shot gets off in time, no one's yeah, asking. Yeah. Oh, it's a brilliant strategy. Yeah, because yeah, it went in. He didn't, it went let, in. he didn't let them set up their defense. Yeah. You know? But that's the problem, though, with that. Like, that's the thing. There was a lot of time on the clock. You know, they it, they, they should have gone a little slightly earlier, but it's not like, you know, they had, what, 19 seconds left to start? And didn't, and didn't get a shot off. Officially speaking, did not yeah. get a shot off, which that, is that, inexcusable. That's kind of start. That's what got Mike Budenholz are fired, right? Well, that was different. He had he needed right. to call a timeout to advance the ball, right? They, you know, they like they, you know, they had a lot less time. I, I shouldn't compare the two. To be to be it's, to it's be fair though, I mean, they they had to start a little bit earlier, but they still had to kill a clock. Like I, I don't, you know, some people yes are like well, no. we should have gone I mean, faster, and I'm like, well, but the, if you go too fast, then you give Philly a chance at rebuttal here. So it, yeah, I I understand you, trying you to you should out. you should have gone faster because. If you don't score, you foul, and Philly, if they hit both, they're up by three. Yeah. You still have another bite at the apple. Right. Or maybe you miss and you get a chance at the rebound. Sure. I mean, you know, exactly. Or or if uh, if you miss and Philadelphia goes down and, and Philadelphia misses, you get the ball back with, you know, right. down one instead of that, you know. But it's, it's funny. Um, I'm sure I've told this before. Uh, few hours before game seven, 2010 against the Lakers, um, which is funny. It goes back to like, everybody thinks that, I, that Ainge was feeding me stuff. And it's like, no, he's the GM of the team I cover back then. I was covering that team. You know, um, I'm going to talk to him as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he was sitting courtside and he said, you know, what's funny is that after this game, one team is going to have everything figured out. And people are going to be fitting them for a dynasty. And the other team is going to go back to the drawing board and rethink everything. He goes, and we're here right now. They're going to throw the ball up in a short while. And we don't know which team is which right now. So, so much of the narrative gets built on, does this shot go down? Does this shot not go down? I mean, if if Kevin Garnett posts up in the fourth quarter of that game, the Celtics have another banner, another ring, and that 
grouping, that big three grouping is looked at as a huge success uh, instead of looking at as, oh, if only they, you know, they never quite um, reached the potential that they had. Uh, you know, it's it's crazy, but that's, you know, so I'd rather look at things that are larger than whether this shot went down or didn't and look at, okay, how did you get to that spot? How did you get to the spot where you needed, where the game was tied and you needed a bucket uh, to win in regulation? Uh, or you get uh, the game, you're down by a point and you needed to score at, at the end. Well, you know, what were the factors that got you? And I go back to what we said earlier. You know, the way you played, you know, you, you played like you were supposed to to get yourself back into the game to get back from a, a double figure deficit. But, you know, you shouldn't have been there. So expectations for game five. Evan, you know, we heard him earlier to take the points, take him in the first half. Uh-huh. You know, I, I, we, we'd all love this to be a, a curb stopping like it was in game two. That's probably unrealistic, but who knows? Garden crowd. Everyone's lively. Maybe it's a Tatum game, yada, yada, yada. What do you expect? Is this going to be a comfortable win for Boston? Are you even confident it will be a win for Boston? I don't expect anything. I, seriously, I just I don't. It's like I don't I don't have that attachment to it. I, I, I want to see what happens. That's my, my curiosity is like, okay, how are you going to come out? How are you going to play? Are you going to come out like you did in game one when the crowd was all, all there then? And all of a sudden, like you let it slip away. How could you let that happen? You know? So I, you know, I learn not to expect anything. I'm not rooting anyway, one way or the other. So I, you know, it's like, yeah, let, let's see. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I, maybe I should be a little less confident, but given the way the series has gone and I I'm feeling that, uh, that Boston understands that. I mean, if given the quotes after the game, I, I was actually pretty impressed. I don't know if you guys saw this with how quickly Jalen kind of owned the mistake at the end of the game of being, you know, I tried to double when I shouldn't have tried to make a play, you know, credit to Embiid for making the pass credit to Harden for making the shot, but I shouldn't have done that. Like, I, I feel like this team has a good understanding of, okay, well, this one slipped away. We need to do something better in game five. But yeah, again, it's to your point, Steve, you know, talk is cheap. And uh, we'll see what happens when they roll the ball up or throw it up uh, in the air. But uh, I don't know. I, I trust this team's, you know, ability to respond. Um, and they've done that so far. We'll, we'll see. Again, the, the problem is, as we all sit here, is they're somewhat lackadaisical, t- lackadaisical tendencies to come out and, mis- and mis- un- misjudge their opponent and misunderstand their opponent. But, you know, I think Boston's got a good idea at this point of, of what they can do. This is the thing that I love about this series is, and they talk about, like I mean, Mark Jones talks about it often. Whenever he's on the game, I feel like it's the storyline of oh, this is the most most played you know uh, rivalry in in NBA you know playoff history. These two teams have been the most times. I think it's just interesting that these two teams specifically versions of them have met a ton. Like Boston and Embiid have this huge history of 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 games together. You know, Embiid what got a second win all time in the playoffs against. Against the Celtics, while he's played, obviously didn't play in game one. So, you know, I don't know if we want to count that, but if you want to, there's three. But, you know, he hasn't had a ton of success against Boston this year, uh, this, this, his career. So it's not like, um, you know, if I'm Philly, I'm feeling super confident. It hasn't been a lot of winning. You know, Boston's been on top a lot more. That's for sure. So I don't know. I guess uh, I need to, I need to check myself maybe uh, Tuesday afternoon and say, hey, I, maybe we need to give Philly a little more respect. It's like um, the big thing is like, have they learned their lesson? You know, mm. it starts sounding like Senator Collins from Maine. Oh, like, boy. Learned a lesson this time. No, not really. Um, <laughs> after game two, I talked to Mark at Smart Aside, and I, I encourage you to read the story. Find the story, read it. Um, and I, like I said to him, I said, look, are you, you know, are you a little worried that, that you know, you guys are going to, you know, you had, you had this huge success in game two, that it's gonna you're gonna fall back to your old habits again. It's like no, I'm not even a not even a little worried. He goes, uh, he goes. Am I aware? Yes. And then we got into the routine, and he picked up on it, which I give him infinite credit for. I said it's, it's like that Three Stooges episode where where Larry says, you know, that uh, he's not. You know, Mo asked if he's scared, and uh, Larry says, No, I'm not scared. I'm apprehensive. And uh, <laughs> Mo said, That's a pretty big word. What does it mean? And Larry says, it means you're scared with a college education. <laughs> and I started to say it. 
Marcus picked it right up and he, you know, so um, yeah, uh, they're aware of what they do. They're aware of this stuff. They should have learned their lesson. You know, did they learn it when they had a chance to go up three to one against the Warriors in the NBA finals? Should have learned it. Should have learned it back in 2018 when they had the, the, um, the Cavaliers in Boston game seven conference finals. They should have learned the lesson then. They should have learned it in 19. Should have learned it in 20. 21 was a mess. Um, but they go away from what they do best and they pay for it. So, uh, well, last thing for me, in the spirit of uh, apprehension versus scared, I will ask you something that is not a prediction, but I do want a feeling. I was talking to Sean about this the other day. We both believed at the time, I, I would say probably still believe, I believe, um, the winner of this series will represent the East in the NBA Finals. That sounds like I'm just completely overlooking the Knicks or Heat. I'm not. I just think that these two teams are better than the Knicks and Heat. Do you believe that the winner of this series will be in the NBA Finals, or do you give that other side of the bracket a little more credit than I am? Uh, I believe if the Celtics win this series, that they'll, they should be in the NBA Finals. I mean, look, I, I thought that they, before the playoffs started, I thought they should be in the NBA Finals. Mm -hmm. um, if it's Philadelphia and New York or Miami, wow you got a lot of weird stuff that's going to get into that one. You know, I mean, I think that could be a real strange series, you know, um, with the, you know, uh, the, the heat are, are so Butler reliant. The Knicks are so Jalen Brunson reliant. Um, you know, what happens with, if they go, you know, defensively, I'm not sure that the, the Sixers have the ability to, you know, to muster forces like they need to. Because uh, even today, you know, you look at what hurt the Celtic offense, and it was, you know, a lot of themselves, a lot of missing some some wide open shots. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I would say Celtics, but I don't. I wouldn't tell you if the Celtics somehow find a way to lose this series, which I I still find it hard to believe. But I, you know, certainly the poss possibilities are there. Um, I'm worried I, about the banana peel game, Steve. Yeah, well, should be. You, go. you know, or hey, last year, but last year, it told you what you needed to know about the Celtics' capabilities when they went into Milwaukee and Tatum went crazy yep. and they won game six. You know, um, they've got this ability. And, you know, anyway. Ev, anything less from you? Terrified of Jimmy Butler constantly. That's <laughs> That guy, oh, I have the most respect for Jimmy Butler. I think of some serious PTSD like, around man, here. That guy's Miami. awesome. That guy is awesome. I love him. Uh, man, just a bunch of respect to Jimmy Butler. I'm way up on my list. Way but if you're the Celtics and you get him in the playoff series and you just crowd the living hell out of him, then, then it the, might not matter. <laughs> then he's, yeah. Finds a way. No, but it helps. There's no, you know, hero this time around. Right. But they've got, you know, um, the guy the Celtics kept uh, gave Struce. away uh, yeah, for, instead of Javante. Yeah, I mean, some of their role players just seem to have a game. Like it's yeah. whether it's Caleb sure. Martin. Or oh, if if, if we Lowry, wind, yeah, if if Gabe we Benson, wind up, I mean, one a game goes off. I mean, then sure. Bam, who's look isn't isn't uh, Sam Hauser like a perfect Miami Heat shooter? Sure. I mean, he, he's the kind of guy that would be like a star on Miami. You know, they'd be oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. and all that Good stuff. stuff. Which they don't no, I, if, if we get the opportunity to preview a Boston Miami conference finals, I, I absolutely will have my riff at some point about fearing the Max Truce 30 point game that will be inevitable when they, you know, steal a game that way. It's just, it, it, but hopefully we can even get to that point. That's, that's just yeah. us, you know, having fun looking ahead and all that. What, what we need to do right now is look ahead to Tuesday night and that is back in Boston. That's game five, seven 30. And uh, we do not have times for games six and uh, if necessary, seven, just yet, of course, six will be Thursday in Philadelphia. Seven I'm would be Sunday. To see Let's if I've got anything from the league yet. And I do not. Okay. But well, they give him a couple of days off. But I can tell you that uh, that uh, you will be getting uh, uh, a tweet 
uh, giving you the Sultan of Stats offerings from today's game. Oh, there we go. Just received that. So, I mean, this, you know, look, yeah. Celtics lost today. Red Sox lost today. Mm. Uh, some Screwed people, up the Boston parlay. Some people, okay. some people lost some money, you know, of playing yeah. online betting. Mm. But there is some reason to live, and it's that the Sultan of Stat, Dick Blight, will be uh, providing his, uh, his goodness um, over my, from my Twitter account uh, about five minutes after we finish with this mess. I right. do look forward to that. Uh, once again, uh, great sponsors of ours, Evan, that allow us to do this show a couple of times a week, and we will continue Angel, to getting into uh, next week as well. I guess probably if if I were to guess, don't hold me to it, viewer, listener. Uh, I, I appreciate you. Um, say probably Wednesday feels like a good time, you know, right right yeah. after uh, you know dive dive back into this thing after game five and see how we're feeling at, at that point in time, and I I hope we're feeling really good but we'll we'll see i think the way to be able to tell this again if you don't if, if someone out there is like watches this on was it on on youtube or whatever it is, mm-hmm. where, is it, where do they get this yeah yeah youtube uh, twitter wherever don't watch the game just <laughs> turn on turn on this on this podcast on wednesday and if evan's receiving oxygen you know it's not good news yeah that's right if i, if I open the show screaming into a pillow yeah yeah, no, it's true. Uh, all right. Well, Steve, thank you as always for hopping on with us. I, I am certain we will bug you again throughout the playoffs, hopefully to talk Boston, otherwise other series going on, but ideally Boston. And, uh, you know, you've been such a good friend of this program. Obviously, we will uh, continue to uh, check out all of your work over at Heavy and make sure you're following him on Twitter, folks, as uh, you know, as as we always tell you to do, obviously, because uh, there's there's just great Celtics and overall NBA insights over there on Heavy from one Steve Bullpet and our good friend Sean Devney as well, who joined us on the last show. Evan, can you give me like a little like uh, um, reader for my Steve B. Hoop Twitter account? You know, like, I mean, I mean, I know I'm not FanDuel, I'm not paying you, but you know. I mean, how about, how about a little something, you know, for the effort, the llama? All I'm saying is if you want the most comprehensive coverage besides CLNS Media, Steve B. Hoop on Twitter is a good one. That's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, I mean, look, <laughs> Steve, your reputation at this point speaks for yourself. I mean, at, at, at a certain point. I mean, Let's I, leave my reputation out of this. I, w- I would <laughs> just tell you that at a, cer- at a certain point in coverage, you were the godfather of the Celtics beat, and it was just whatever you came out with was was it. Was it. So, well, I know was it I like achieving that status? Is, pardon me? Was it like achieving okay. that status as a beat writer of being yeah, like well, the – the go-to voice that everybody like if once Steve says it, it's 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 that's what it is, you know. That's, that's it's true. Great. There was I mean, I, I I hope you know. I think you know. I've talked to you about it. There there was a you know, it, I mean, because of you you made the joke earlier, but because of the reputation of like Danny Ainge is feeding Steve, you know, because of that during all those, you know, 15 whatever years that that Danny was here, especially those years that you were at the Herald, it was like, you know, Woj would come out with a tweet and or 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 whomever you know windhorst or shams or like all these national guys spears would be like oh all right but has has steve written about it yet what has steve said yeah i you know what's funny is i never really clapped back at it when people would say stuff like that because i knew that it's like the the cell and i've talked to dominique about this in the last series how he said you know the uh it's the old garden that, that Red Auerbach made their dressing room hotter and the showers cold. Yeah. It was the same way in the Celtics locker room, but they just wanted, they, they never said anything about it because they wanted you to think they were screwing you over. You know, <laughs> and it's like, like Ainge, I've known him since, you know, since I started on the beat in 85 and would talk to him, you know, but he talked to everybody. But the, the people would say that he was giving me stuff and I, I never said anything against it. It wasn't true. But I never say anything against it because I knew that it was pissing other people off. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like okay, let him be pissed and think that's where I'm getting it from, and I'm not. Yeah, you know, was, I used to, I had a couple of knockdown drag out brawls with Ainge because he wouldn't tell me something. It's like, jeez. <laughs> That that that's what we gotta get into next time is what are the stuff that you wanted Ainge to tell you that you didn't tell? Yeah. We'll get into everything. That. I, want, I want everyone to tell me everything. <laughs> yeah. just, funny thing, this came up with a friend recently. So that whole reputation of that, crazy. I, I talked to everybody other teams. That's where I was. Other teams didn't like the Celtics. Mm-hmm. So that's where they went. So they'd talk to you about the Celtics. Mm. It's a good little hint there. You know, if you want to get something about somebody, talk to the people that don't like them or that, or, you know, 
Um, <laughs> Good life lesson, actually. That's there you go. Um, uh, so, a bunch of years ago, it was all, I can tell you exactly what year it was. It was the summer of 2007. And the Celtics were at Summer League. We we're out in Vegas, and um, they were Celtics were practicing at some high school. And it's like, Ainge goes, Teeth, come here, I can tell you something. And it's like, freaking finally, he's going to drop something on me. And he gets to him aside. He goes, I, gotta, I go, what? What, Danny? What? He goes, I got to tell you, Rondo is really good. <laughs> it's like, you jerk. Well, he was right. <laughs> you know, that was Rondo going into his second year. It's like, yeah. Doc wanted him, wanted Ainge to get him a veteran point guard, and Danny wouldn't because he wanted to force Doc to play Rondo. And yeah. it's like, you brung me over here. You got me all excited. And that's what you're going to tell me. You know? <laughs> to his credit, like, Rondo was dude. good. As the future yeah. captain of the Boston Celtics at the yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, so it's, it's, that's. Uh, I'm not sure we got to that point in this discussion. That's crazy yeah. your Twitter feed, Steve. That's all it was all about. Yeah. I'll give you your well, disclaimer. We got about five minutes out of it. We got more than the. Uh, there you go. Handle disclaimer. So, so yeah. Perfect. So the beat is the beat. It's a. It's, it was great being on the beat for all those years. But it wasn't a healthy lifestyle. I'll put it that way. Never is. I'm like about thirty pounds lighter now, and uh, eating properly, and my and stuff works on my body now. And uh, at least I'll, I'll tell this story. And it wasn't really so much a joke um, that my primary care physician at Mass General wanted me off the beat worse than the rears did. <laughs> he, every That's time I go in, it's like, so uh, anything else working for you? Anything else? Any other opportunities uh, come up? Uh, <laughs> Any job changes on the on the horizon here, Steve? Yeah, he was not happy with, uh, you know, the 75 straight days working Oof. during playoffs. Anyway. And like that anyone, in mind, basketball like every night in the playoffs. About this stuff here now. Let's go, yeah. For Steve Bullpett, Evan Valenti, I'm Adam Kaufman. Celtics beat twice a week on the CLNS Media Network. Join us. Find us on Twitter, wherever you get your podcasts, obviously. Rate, review, subscribe on uh, Apple. You can get us on YouTube. Comment there. We always appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next time, hopefully after a Game 5 win.